As Chad told you, I worked for the department for 33 years as a lawyer. Um, and um, my presentation has a little bit of a department bias because of that. That's where I spent my career. If it helps at all for, for some of you, uh, the reason I became interested in law was because my major professor at UW-Stevens Point, George Becker, sued the Department of Natural Resources when they were poisoning trout streams around the state. And um, I went out with some of the other students to, um, to collect specimens when they were poisoning up on the Tomorrow River. And uh, George Becker's hypothesis was that they should remove some of the dams to get the rough, stream, rough fish out of the rivers and streams. And, um, and he, he went to court and lost. And so myself and some other students went out and we were collecting these fish specimens and hanging them up for the press to see and weighing them and aging them. And the second day the wardens came out and said, the students can't touch these fish. This is George's scientific collector's permit. And um, so I, I was sort of mad about that. And so I decided I was going to go to law school and, and work for the DNR and straighten the organization out. <laughs> and um, I didn't accomplish that, but I, I did uh, enjoy my career there and um, was able to, to work in uh, the area that I was interested in, which is water law. Um, for the bulk of my career. And so what I, what I want to talk about tonight is the um, Wisconsin's Public Trust Doctrine. Um, this, it emanates from the Wisconsin Constitution, Article 9, Section 1 of the Wisconsin Constitution. There's a large body of common law or court-made law, um, you know, which holds that all navigable waters are held in trust by the state uh, for the public. And the state has an affirmative duty to protect and preserve these, uh, these public trust waters. Um, you know, just from some history and perspective, Wisconsin has about 5 million acres of wetlands remaining, 15,000 lakes, 44,000 miles of streams, 860 miles of Great Lake shoreline. As all of you know, there's a lot of water in the state, and uh, there are every, every day in my job it was interesting because there are always issues, and I know that a lot of you people are interested in our waters, and you've had a lot of issues that, that you have dealt with in the local waters here. Um, understanding the ecology and importance of our waters, I think, has really evolved over time. And coming out of, the, of school as a biologist and seeing some of the evolution and being involved in some of the evolution of our regulations um, was interesting. You know, and our regulations have also evolved and they're continuing to evolve, and I'll talk about some of that tonight. Um, this is always a controversial issue. Um, working in Madison uh, in this area, I spent a lot of time um, both in court, but I also spent a lot of time over in the legislature. And I'm sure some of you have, have heard about and read about some of the things that have gone on in the legislature. You know, often people ask, well, why is this doctrine important today? Um, you know, with the abundance of waters that we have in the state, and, you know, you are familiar with them, um, and you, you care about them, which is why you're here, um, it still is very important. Um, as a biologist, one of the things that I tell people when I talk to lawyers and other people is, you know, it's not just a legal doctrine. It's also important in preserving the aquatic resources that we have for future generations. Um, one of the things that's sobering for me, um, you know, I'm now 62 years old, I grew up on a farm down in southwest Wisconsin, and my, my grandfather you know, came across the, the Mississippi River with his cattle and settled a farm down there. And I fished the trout, trout streams and I fished in the Mississippi River. And, you know, I'm not against development, but I've seen the changes that have occurred you know, since my, my father was a young man and since I was a young man. Um, and we all have a responsibility to make sure, and the trust doctrine that helps us do that, you know, th these resources continue for future generations. It's also important to Wisconsin's economy. And I think as, our, as there's been more pressure on the resources, uh, I think it's become more important. Um, and you know, you folks here, and certainly in northern Wisconsin, Door County, know the, the value of the aquatic resources from an economic standpoint. Um, another reason that it's important is that is that there's a point. Some of the research has been done looking at the development that's occurred. Uh, this was some research that was done in the mid 1990s, looking at 235 lakes in northern Wisconsin, and the the dwellings, the increase in the number of dwellings on those lakes. Um, of 500 to 1,000 acres was 800% during that period of time. Now recently some of this has slowed down with the recession, but we have seen a lot of development in Wisconsin. That's not necessarily bad, but it has that impact. Um, and it impacts the littoral zone, that area is, you know, the shoreline, that's where people who own property want to do things, but it's also often the most biologically important part of our waterways, and I know that Sometimes here you've had too many aquatic plants, but I've spent a lot of my career trying to preserve some of the nat native aquatic plants uh, to protect resources. 
Uh, and there's a constant tension between you know, that shoreline and both you know, people who, who utilize the waterway and people who live on the waterway. And so that's sort of where um, I think the, the law comes into play. Uh, riparian owners, people who own waterfront property, um, you know, they do have rights. They clearly have property rights. And they have the right to access the shore and make reasonable use of the shore. But these rights are limited by the public rights and the public trust doctrine. Um, this is a picture that was taken by the department in the 1960s of a developed lot in Vilas County. Um, there's a house, there's a car here, and there's a house back here behind the trees, and this is a pier um, in the 1960s. And when I first started doing cases for the Department of Natural Resources in the 1970s, sometimes we were looking for the impacts of motorboats, um, and we went to look at the scientific research, and the only scientific research we could find was looking at the impacts of five horsepower motorboats on a 14-foot 14, 14 motorboat on some lakes in Iowa. And it was funded by the Johnson Corporation. You know, in the 1970s, we weren't looking at those sorts of motors very much anymore. And this is a case I was involved with up in Vilas County, uh, which is a single property owner. And you know, they had their pontoon boat, and they had the ski boat, and they had the wooden criss craft, and they had a, a, a large deck with a wet bar, and he had two jet skis, and he had a musky boat, um, all along one waterfront. You know, which is okay, but you know, if you do this, if you all along the shoreline, it obviously has impacts on the on the resources along the shoreline. You know, there's been a lot of research that's been done. The Department of Natural Resources and the UW has been done looking at you know what are the impacts of this sort of shoreline development. Um, they've shown that if you get up to 30 plus homes per mile. Um, you know, there's a large impact on, you know, some of the, the reptiles and frogs. Um, you know, we talk to people in the legislature and they go, well, why does that matter? You know, it matters because, you know, these are part of the terrestrial and aquatic food chains and we need to maintain those populations. Uh, similarly with plants, um, this is, um, in some of the cases I was involved with, uh, this is a, a person who used to work in this area for the department who was a diver and we would go uh, to get evidence to show that there were impacts and per persuade both people in the legislature and, and property owners that there were impacts. Um, this is a case that we had up in Florence County uh, where there was a very diverse uh, you know, bed of aquatic plants along the shoreline and this was a large deck that we were concerned about uh, that basically created this, uh, you know, the, the plants disappeared and created this <coughs> depauper environment um, along the shoreline. We had situations with marinas where they have done similar things. Um, and again, people in the legislature would say, well, why does this matter? Well, if you want to maintain a perch population up in the Florence County Lake, you know, this is perch eggs draped over vegetation, over the aquatic plants, and, you know, we per finally persuaded some of the folks in the legislature, well, maybe we do need to consider, you know, the, these ecological impacts. And I know that sometimes around here and places where there's a Eurasian uh, water mill fail, you have too many plants, and that's also a problem but uh, we have to find a balance. I want to go back now and talk about some of the history of the um, Wisconsin's public trust doctrine. Wisconsin was carved out of the Northwest Territory, and, and then in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, there was language that said that the navigable waters leading into the Mississippi and the St. Lawrence and their carrying places between them um, shall be common highways and forever free, both for the citizens of the territory and the citizens of the United States. Um, and when Wisconsin became a when Wisconsin became a, um, a state, this language was adopted verbatim as part of section section nine, article one of the Wisconsin Constitution. And the Wisconsin, the public trust doctrine, and Wisconsin has mo one of the most highly evolved public trust doctrines, has grown out of this provision in the Wisconsin Constitution. Um, one of the earliest cases was in 1898, Willow River versus Wade. Um, some folks came out of the Twin Cities, uh, industrialists, uh, people with a fair amount of money, and they bought land on both sides of the Willow River. Um, you know, the Willow River was a, a, a very fine trout stream, and they said, this is ours. Uh, Mr. Wade was a local attorney, and he waded out there, and he caught some, <laughs> waded down the river, and caught some trout, and he was arrested. And he took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court in 1898 said, well, Yes, they own the bed, and they own the shore, but they don't own the water, and they don't own the fish. You know, it's a public right, if you can gain legal access to the water, um, you know, to use, utilize these areas for fishing. 
And there were a lot of other states that hadn't gone that far in 1898, so that was an important case. Another important case that happened not too far south of here on the Horicon Marsh was uh, Diana Shooting Club versus Houston in 1914. Um, and in this case, Mr. Houston, who was a local lawyer, he also was a state senator, um, he was a member of the, the Greenhead Duck Club down in Horicon Marsh. And the Diana, and, and they allowed other members of the public to come and use the marsh in front of their area and along the Rock River. The Diana Shooting Club on the other side of the marsh said, nobody can come into this area. Uh, and you know, he, he felt that that was wrong. And so he took his skiff and he pulled down the river and pulled into the vegetation along the river and shot a couple of ducks and got arrested. Um, and he took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. The local court said he had a right to do that because he was on public navigable waters. And the, the Supreme Court in 1914 upheld his right uh, to hunt and said that in addition to fishing, you know, hunting was also a public right. Uh, they recognized the public nature of navigable waters, uh, the need to broadly construe the trust that the state uh, accepted upon, uh, upon statehood so that people reap the full benefit of the grant secured to them at statehood. Um, the state became a trustee charged with the faithful execution of the trust created for their benefit. Um, and in 1914, they said the wisdom of the policy which steadfastly and carefully preserved the people the full and free use of public waters cannot be questioned, nor should it be limited by narrow constructions. Um, I, I quoted this in virtually every brief I wrote for the department because, as I said, we were often dealing with this tension between you know, the rights of the general public and the rights of, of people who, who owned private land. And you know, Wisconsin has been one of the leaders in this area. In the 1930s, you know, when Wisconsin first became a state, our navigable waterways were used primarily for pecuniary purposes, for driving the saw logs, for you know, taking furs to market, um, and for purposes of transportation. In the 1930s, there was a case that went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know, many of our waters are no longer used simply for pecuniary purposes, um, and they recognized as public rights, public uses, things like canoeing, swimming, sailing, skating. They said people are using our waters now for recreational purposes and they broadened significantly the public rights that were recognized under the trust doctrine. In Minch versus uh, Public Service Commission in 1951, and the Public Service Commission was the agency that was responsible for administering, the, administering water laws before the DNR was created. Um, this was a case that dealt with a dam that was proposed on the Namakagan River, you know, which is now part of the National Wild and Scenic River System. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Minch didn't live in the area, but he enjoyed canoeing in the Namakagan. And uh, he opposed the dam. And the case went to the Supreme Court. And one of the issues was, you know, does Mr. Minch, who is a citizen of the state, but doesn't live on the river, have the right? Does he have standing, legal standing, to, to try to protect the river? And the court said, yes, he does, any citizen because this is a constitutional provision, has the right to stand up and say, you know, I'm concerned about what's happening with this water body. And they also said in 1951, and the legislature had said a couple of years earlier, that enjoyment of natural scenic beauty is a public right. Which, you know, looking back now, to me, that's, that was a pretty momentous leap to say that enjoyment of scenic beauty is a public right in 1951. Um, in 1969, and this, I was a student at UW-Stevens Point at this time, and this is when the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act were being adopted on the national scene of the Cuyahoga River was burning. And there was a case that went to the Supreme Court dealing with a dredging project. And the, the, uh, at that time, the DNR was just two years old. And in looking at a dredging permit, uh, they looked at water quality issues. And the permit was denied. And the person who had the permit denied you know, took it to the Supreme Court and said, this is ridiculous. You know, we've got these crazy people over there saying, you know, that we have to be concerned about water quality. And the Supreme Court said, of course, you know, that's an appropriate consideration when looking at that. Because if you change water quality, that impacts people's ability to, to enjoy the water, to utilize the water, it affects habitat. And looking back now, it's like, well, of course that's something you consider. But as recently, I can say that as an old man, as recently as 1969, um, you know, that, that was a question that went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, the protected public trust uses then have been recognized by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Um, certainly commercial navigation, you know, those were, that was the earliest one, boating, fishing, hunting, scenic beauty, fish and wildlife habitat, um, and water quality and quantity. All of these things have been recognized by the Wisconsin Supreme Court as things that are protected under that constitutional provision. 
And the Department of Natural Resources, um, you know, their mission is to try to balance these competing interests. And as all of you know, who have been involved with either you know rivers or lakes, um, you know, there often are competing use, competing interests. Uh, who have different opinions about what should be done, and it's the department's responsibility you know, to try to balance those competing interests. Now, the, the, many of the common law doctrines have been incorporated into the statutes, and there are statutory limitations. Um, you know, 2439 and, and 3011 in the statutes deal with bulkhead lines and leases. 13.097 uh, is lake bed grants, wharves, piers, and swimming rafts, structures and deposits. Uh, boat houses, bridges, grading on the banks and ponds, dredging, um, and dams and water levels. All of these things that have now been codified, they're put into statutes, and for many of them there are rules that have also been adopted. And for the majority of things that the common law principles still hold, but there are specific statutes and rules uh, that the Department of Natural Resources and local governments are responsible for administering. But all of them sort of exist under this overlying public trust doctrine and the constitutional provisions. Uh, there are other statutes and programs that aren't listed there showing the wetland zoning, the WPDS, which is the, the point source and non-point source discharge permits, stormwater permits, groundwater issues, wetland regulations, invasive species. Uh, there are also statutes, <coughs> excuse me, dealing with, with those issues. I spent a lot of time working in the legislature and often people would come in and they'd want to undertake a project and the department would look at it and say, that's not something that we're going to be able to permit. And they would go to their legislator and their legislator would call us across the street and say, if you don't permit this, I'm going to propose a statute and we're going to permit it by statute. And so something that I carried in my briefcase all the time was this case of Prewe versus Wisconsin Land and Improvement Company. It's a case from 1899, and because this is a constitutional provision, there are constitutional limits as to what the legislature can do. And they cannot authorize something which is going to be violative of the public's right and the public trust. And in the pre and Wisconsin Land Improvement Company, the Wisconsin Land Improvement Company, which is a company out of Illinois, <coughs> Big Muskego Lake is, all, is in southeast Wisconsin, sort of a deep marsh. And they got some legislators to adopt a piece of legislation to allow the drainage of Big Muskego Lake uh, so that it could then be used for agricultural purposes and for land development. Uh, Mr. Prewe took that to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court in 1899 said the legislature has no more authority to do that than it does to donate the school fund or the state capital to a private purpose. Um, you know, and this is sort of interesting in a historical context, but I can tell you that. You know, this is something that we probably used, I probably used in my office, you know, 10 or 15 times a year uh, because people would come in with proposals and we say that that's not something that's, that will be permissible under the trust doctrine. And I'll talk about some of those issues. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about some cases that, um, at least in my work, were important. Uh, State versus Public Service Commission in 1956. Uh, this is a case that dealt with a proposal in, uh, in Lake Wingra which is in the city of Madison, and this is Vilas Park. There's a zoo there and there's a park. Um, and there was a proposal to fill in, this is about a 230-acre lake, to fill in four acres of wetlands, which was part of the bed of a lake, to use for city park purposes. And it went to the Supreme Court to say, well, does the legislature have the right to do this? You know, can they authorize the filling of this public land um, you know, for any purpose? And the Supreme Court said in 1956 that public bodies have to control it. Um, it must be devoted to public trust purposes and must be open to the public. Uh, it must be a minimal area relative to the, the size of the waterway. And uh, the public uses of the waterway are not uh, destroyed or greatly impaired. And that the loss of public rights is negligible. Um, and this is, uh, this is the area that was filled in. There are some lagoons remaining, but it's, uh, you know, it is a very nice park and I use it often. Um, I used it with my family a lot when they were young. Um, and this is a very good musky lake today. Uh, but, uh, but this was an important case in 1956. Now I spent a lot of time in my job where I would tell people we would go and you know, often we were able to work through problems, sometimes we weren't. And we would tell people, you can't put this fill in this wetland or this part of the lake. And one of the questions that I constantly got um, especially after the, the convention center was built on the bed of Lake Monona in Madison is, well, why did you allow that? 
and that you tell us that we can't do anything in our lake. Um, there was a companion case to, to the 1956 decision I just talked about, which was Madison versus State in 1957. This also went to the Supreme Court, and this is the convention center in Madison. Uh, this is the original shoreline of, of Lake Monona, um, and part of this was basically you know, built on pilings over the lake. Um, this, the, in 1957, the Supreme Court said that this met the requirements of the trust doctrine because they said this was a public building and it would, would improve people's uh, enjoyment of the lake. Uh, personally, I think that wasn't a very good decision, but it is a decision that was rendered by the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court. When the city of Madison came back you know, many years later and said they wanted to build this, you know, we thought, well, this is a bad idea. But we looked at it and it was exactly the same set of plans with exactly, exactly the same footprint. And so we said there's, you know, there's no way we could stop it because the Supreme Court had said that this is an acceptable use. I still think it's a bad use and we haven't seen more of these, so please don't propose any <laughs> in, in this area. Um, Hickson versus Public Service Commission. Um, this went to the Supreme Court in 1966. Uh, Mr. Hickson was a, a lumber baron. Um, he lived in La Crosse. Um, and he had some property on a um, plum lake in uh, a 950 acre, 8 acre lake in Vilas County. Um, you know, he dredged and filled an area to create a 120 foot long breakwater out into the lake. Um, and the state of Wisconsin, uh, first the Public Service Commission and then the, the DNR after the DNR came into uh, being in 1967, um, went, went after this project and said he had to pull this from the lake. And, he said, this is ridiculous. You know, this is a thousand, almost a thousand acre lake and I've got a 120 foot breakwater that I built here. He, he dredged out a sandbar here and put the fill here. And, and he said that he needed this in order to be able to use his waterfront <clears throat> because he had a bad heart. I talked to some of the wardens who had worked the case uh, back when it went to the courts and they said, well, what he was doing was he was putting minnow traps out here and he was casting for muskies as they cruised in over the minnow traps. And they didn't think he needed it. But the Supreme Court in 1966 said, a little fill here and there may seem to be nothing to become excited about, but one fill, though comparatively inconsequential, may lead to another and another, and before long a great body of water may be eaten away. Looking at that from an ecological perspective, you know, I thought, you know, this is really very good, good law, and it's also good science, because while many of these things, this seemed like him like an inconsequential act. But if you repeat this along every shoreline in the state, um, you lose a lot of habitat and it really has an, an impact. This is what he was allowed to keep and uh, the court said uh, you know, our navigable waters are a precious natural heritage. Once gone, they disappear forever. Now, one of the things that uh, I found it interesting, you know, I was still in high school when that case was decided and didn't know anything about it until I got to law school. Um, and worked for the department, but Aldo Leopold, um, who wrote the Sand County Almanac in 1949, was a professor at UW-Madison. He was very actively involved um, in, you know, in conservation, um, the development of conservation programs and laws in the state of Wisconsin. And I think that uh, many of his ideas have been incorporated into um, Wisconsin's conservation laws, and really they, they helped inform the, the people who, as they were working on water cases and help build the trust doctrine. Um, you know, if you're at all interested in this, there's a, a really interesting book uh, called Protectors of Land and Water, Environment, Environmentalism in Wisconsin from 1991 to 68. Wisconsin DNR was created in 1967. Um, this talks about, um, you know, he interviewed uh, Warren Knowles and Gaylord Nelson and some of the other leaders about their activities through this time. Um, you know, personally, I hope I live long enough to, still, to see bipartisan support for protection of our water resources. Um, I think that you know, we've seen some problems from my perspective um, and we have a very rich history in Wisconsin you know, on both sides of the aisle um, to protect, our, you know, protect Wisconsin's resources for future generations. And, and I think that many of you know, I was impressed when I came to the department and I had the ability as I was there you know, to try to incorporate some of these ecological um, processes and, and ideas into both our laws and the administration of them. Uh, Claflin versus DNR in 1972. This is a, a case involved a boathouse up in Owen, Lake Owen in Bayfield County. A person wanted to, this is not the shoreline, but it's a, it's a picture of an undeveloped shoreline, wanted to, um, to place a boathouse along a shoreline and the Department of Natural Resources objected to it. They didn't have a scientific basis, but they objected to it because 
it was going to impact natural scenic beauty along this undeveloped shoreline, and they didn't, they didn't feel that there was a need for a boathouse there. Uh, and the Supreme Court in 1972 said, you know, the essential determination must be whether this particular boathouse is detrimental to the public interest. Uh, it's entirely proper that natural beauty should be protected. Um, an impairment of natural beauty by itself can serve as a basis for determining a project as detrimental to the public interest. Now, I know there's always been a lot of tension between, you know, people who have waterfront property and are concerned about, you know, the Department of Natural Resources and some of the regulations that they've imposed to try to preserve that you know, the natural character of the shorelines. Um, you know, I don't own water for property, but I think it's important. Um, I, I do a lot of fishing in Wisconsin's waters. I think it's important that we do this, and the courts have recognized this under the trust doctrine. Um, another <coughs> important case, and this was decided when I was in law school, my first year of law school, uh, Just versus Marinette in 1972. This is after the shoreline zoning uh, regulations had first gone into place <coughs> and, and wetland regulations. And um, the, the Just wanted to fill in a wetland to build a house up in Marinette County. And the county objected and denied their permit. And they took it to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and said, this is a taking of our property. You've destroyed the value of our property, and, and we need to be compensated for that. And the Supreme Court in 1972 said, and, and to me there are echoes of Aldo Leopold in this, you know, swamps and wetlands were once considered wasteland undesirable, not picturesque, but as people became more sophisticated, I mean, they realized that they're essential to the purity of our waters, of our lakes and streams. Um, they asked the rhetorical question, is the owner of, of ownership of a parcel of land so absolute that man can change its nature to suit any of his purposes? Um, and they said that no. You know, if you come and you buy a piece of property and it has, you know, a wetland, a high quality wetland, you don't have the, you know, the absolute right to change the essential natural character of that land. Um, you know, this is still recognized nationally as one of the leading cases in, uh, in land use. Um, you know, I have talked around the country about some of our wetland regulations. When I show this out west, you know, people are shocked um, because they have a, a, a different perception of, of private property rights than, than we do here. But this has stood the test of time and I think it will continue to because of, of the trust doctrine in Wisconsin. Um, the Department of Natural Resources uh, and the Public Service Commission before it um, allowed in, in southeast Wisconsin um, a lot of channelized streams. And if you drive through Milwaukee, um, you know, and some of the Menominee, some of the, the cities in southeast Wisconsin, you'll see them everywhere. And uh, there was a time when they, everybody thought this was the best way to deal with flooding issues, this is the best way to deal with water quality, put everything in concrete and get it out into Lake Michigan. And ecologically, people began to realize, you know, and hydrologically, this was a bad idea. It was, it was hastening flooding downstream. Um, you know, it was having a negative impact. And so there was a decision made in the 1980s that uh, the department was no, no longer going to permit these. Um, and this is what they look like. Um, and the, the, the village of Menominee Falls came in with a proposal to channelize and put in concrete five miles of a tributary stream to the Menominee River, and the department said, we're going to object to it. We're not going to grant you this permit. So a group of southeast Wisconsin municipalities banded together and hired lawyers and experts and said, we're going to challenge this policy. Um, I was involved in, in this. And um, you know, one of the things they said is we should have different tests of navigability in urbanized areas. It shouldn't be the same tests that you have up in northern Wisconsin. And the court said, no, the test has to be the same everywhere. The other thing they said is that you know, local governments also have constitutional authority and in, in southeast Wisconsin they should have the authority to decide what to do with these streams. And the Court of Appeals said, no, this is a matter of statewide concern. And this is again one of the reasons the Department of Natural Resources is given, given the authority under the Trust Doctrine you know, to have oversight over these activities. Um, we argued that we needed to consider the comprehensive planning process in place and look at the cumulative impacts. This is what they were ultimately allowed to do. But the aesthetic values of the stream were important um, and there, it would also have a detrimental impact on wildlife. Um, you know, some of the municipal officials scoffed at that. They said there's nothing but rats out there. Um, we were able to show that no, there was actually a fair amount of wildlife in these, these urban streams. Um, but, uh, you know, this was a, and today I'm happy to say that they're spending millions and millions of dollars in municipalities are tearing out these concrete channels because we've all learned, I mean, DNR made the mistakes just like the municipalities. We've all learned that we have to do things differently. 
I'm sure we're doing things today that you know, people will look back you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now and say, what were they thinking? But uh, we'll have to learn. State versus Trudeau, this is a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision in 1987. Um, this is on Madeline Island in the Apostle Islands. Uh, there was a proposal to, to build uh, 48 condos. Um, they basically were going to be in a wetland that was connected to Lake Superior. Um, you know, the developer approached department staff, and you know, this was their overall plan, um, and, uh, and said, this is what we're going to do. And they said, well, this is below the Orme High Watermark of Lake Superior. And while it's wetland vegetation, it's connected to the lake, and it's part of the lake, and the bed is owned by the state. And the developer uh, didn't agree. Um, you know, it went through five years of litigation. Uh, this is the wetland in, in place, and this is Lake Superior, and there was a clear connection. This is a historical map from the 1800s. Um, and uh, the developer went ahead and built the first six units. Uh, Chicago Title Company uh, issued title insurance for these. Um, as you can see, that they're built on pilings uh, out over this, this really wet area. Um, and after five years of litigation, they were removed from the, from the, uh, the lake bed. Um, looking at this from my perspective, both as a, as a department attorney, but as a citizen of the state, I think it's important that we protect these lake beds uh, and these areas for future generations. You know, people in the northwest part of the state took heed, developers did, took heed after this case. Um, and every time I, I met, went to a state bar group and there were people there from Chicago Title, they came up and they were still angry about <laughs> the fact that, that we prevailed because they had issued, had to pay out title insurance for these. Um, down in southeast Wisconsin, this is Sterlingworth versus DNR. We had a, a, a few years ago, there was a lot of condo development. And the condo owners would come in and say, we're going to develop 150, 200, 300 condos and we need a boat slip for every one of them on the lake. And we said, well, that's a problem, you know, especially if you don't have enough prop frontage to support that. And there was a bay um, near this that was one of the un few undeveloped areas left in the, in the, the Lauderdale Lakes area. Um, you know, we were, it was in this little bay here. And Southeast Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission developed this map for it, showing all of the areas that had been heavily developed around the lake. And we didn't have a lot of habitat left. Um, and you know, there was spawning habitat, there was good aquatic plants there. Um, this went to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said, although nine additional boat slips may seem inconsequential you know, to the developer, um, each one allows one more boat, which inevitably risks further damage to the environment and impairs the public interest in lakes. And echoing the Hickson versus Public Service Commission decision in 1966, it says that you know, this is DNR carrying out its assigned duty as protector of the overall public interest um, in maintaining waters. Um, there are other judicial decisions. I won't talk about them in detail. It's in the outline if you have that. Um, one in Gillen versus DNR was up in Nina. Um, there was a proposal by Gladfelter to put a, a, a a facility on the Battle Lake up there. DNR authorized it. A group of citizens challenged it and said that, you know, that it could not be done. The Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, in 1998 said that citizens have standing, even if DNR says something is okay, under the trust doctrine, citizens have standing to come in and challenge that because this is something that even DNR can't authorize things that, uh, that aren't permissible. Hilton versus DNR, this is in Green Lake. Um, this was a backlot keyhole development and uh, went to the Supreme Court dealing with uh, you know, issues, again, of reasonable use and takings and uh, protection of habitat. Um, there was a recent, uh, we now have a fairly conservative Supreme Court in Wisconsin, and if you've been reading the papers, it's somewhat dysfunctional. Um, and I hope that that changes in, in all of our lifetimes. But um, there was a case that went the Lake Beulah Management District uh, versus DNR. Um, this was a high capacity well law and the Lake Buell Management District uh, brought this lawsuit and said we don't want these high cap wells because they're going to impact our lake. And DNR issued the permits and it went to the uh, Supreme Court and one of the questions here was, uh, you know, did DNR have a, a responsibility and authority to look, to look at those lake impacts when it was issuing high capacity well permits? And the Supreme Court uh, unanimously said yes, the DNR did have that responsibility. Um, and they found no language limiting DNR's authority. Um, DNR can utilize its expertise and exercise its discretion. And Justice Ziegler, who's a pretty conservative justice, 
said, the waters of the state are deeply revered. The right of the riparian to the natural flow is of great value in the law. Nowhere has been more persistently recognized in jealousy protected waters than in Wisconsin. This is an important case because it, it seems to expand the trust doctrine to groundwater and to recognize, excuse me, the hydrologic cycle. And it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Some of the current issues, um, you know, that at least when I retired from the department, the department was dealing with development of small lakes around the state. Marginal shorelines, you know, those wetlands that remain on some lakes that were not developed in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and now people want to develop them, and often that's the last remaining spawning habitat. So we have some hellacious battles over those things. The mining proposals and legislation, Great Lakes Compact, new uses of our waters, lake bed grant issues, and some of the legislation. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. Um, lake bed grants um, probably you don't haven't dealt with them a lot in this part of the state. I dealt with them a lot on the Great Lakes, and there are some lake bed grants even in the lakes. Um, and if somebody wants to put a structure um, out in the lake, or if a municipality wants to fill part of a lake, such as the city of Madison did, they have to get a lake bed grant from the legislature. And uh, the Department of Natural Resources and the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands these are the people who are responsible for all state trust lands, and it's the, it's the Attorney General, the Treasurer, and the Secretary of State. Um, they are the board that makes decisions on whether certain things can happen. Uh, some examples, um, we deal a lot in the Milwaukee lakefront. Um, you know, this is the, the Calatrava Museum. This is pure Wisconsin. Um, you know, the original shoreline you know, is back here. And we see constant proposals from Milwaukee in Milwaukee County saying we want to put bars and restaurants and retail facilities out there and we want to skim the profits to help us with our budget and we say no you can't do this this is public land it has to be used for public purposes and so the art museum and pure Wisconsin were seen as public purposes but uh, you know we, we see lots of other proposals up in Ashland uh, there was an ORDOC that's now been abandoned um, and we had proposals for motels and condominiums um, as a reuse for that ORDOC yeah, which covered about four acres of lake bed. Um, and the thing was really had fallen into a state of disrepair. We told locals if they wanted to make a park out of it or some sort of a public use that that was permissible. Um, at this point, this is being, uh, it's being torn down uh, by the railroad company that owned it. Um, and you know, I think it's sort, of, it's sort of sad to see it go, but I think the foundation is probably gonna stay and probably ultimately will become a public park. Um, we have proposals from condo developers. This is up, is up in uh, Sturgeon Bay. This is an old shipyard, which is now abandoned. Um, and the original ordinary high water mark is back along this area. So this is Lake Bend. And um, they came in before the recession with the proposal to build uh, four-story condominiums. Um, they were going to actually uh, cantilever them out over uh, these slips and allow people to drive their 75-foot motorboats underneath them in parking garages. And we said, no, you can't do that. You can't cantilever condos over public water. And we suggested to them that you know they could have all the condos they wanted back here and that this area should be a public park. Um, that project's gone away for a while. I suspect it'll be back in some form. Um, this is one of the more audacious proposals I saw as I was nearing my retirement. This is south of Port Washington. There was a developer, um, he has since gone into bankruptcy, but is doing a lot of Florida developments and developments in the Milwaukee area. They uh, proposed uh, pushing the dunes south of Port Washington out into the lake, uh, 700 feet out into the lake, and developing a, and developing a golf course, um, and having condos and large uh, estate developments. Um, and this, there was a lot of pressure to allow this to happen. And you know, I think the development itself was fine, but um, you know, they suggested that you know, having you know, these, these uh, fairways and golf holes out on the bed of the lake was okay. Um, and we persuaded them that it was not. This is not something that was permissible. If, if we had seen this in Lake Michigan, we would have seen it in Lake Winnebago and we would have seen it elsewhere around the state. Um, and so uh, you know, these proposals come through uh, regularly. These are some of the, the places we've seen these. Uh, some of the emerging issues, um, you know, we recently have had some really low water levels on the Great Lakes. They've stabilized now and they've come back. But a number of years ago, um, I picked up the Milwaukee Journal one morning and I, whoops, I saw this picture on the front page. 
Um, this is Washington Island, or, th or this is Rock Island State Park. Yeah, and this is Washington Island, and at the lowest water levels, there actually was a land bridge that had formed between them. Um, you know, and I think that you know, as we see water levels come down, then we see people coming in, and you know, this is all in exposed land, which is exposed lake bed owned by the state. Uh, but whenever we have these sorts of situations, we see people coming in and wanting to build houses and hotels and other things on there. I, I think that it'll be interesting to see what happens with the lake, lake levels around the state. Um, you know, in central Wisconsin, central Sands area, uh, we've had some very low water levels, which a lot of people assert is due to high capacity wells. Um, I think that these have also stabilized somewhat in the last year, uh, but I think we're going to see the, uh, a lot of issues about that. I think the, you know, the Lake Mula decision, I think, is probably going to affect some of these situations where, you know, the Supreme Court has recognized that you have to look at uh, these impacts to the groundwater levels. Um, and so I think that's going to be interesting. And south, this is uh, near Spring Green in, in southern Wisconsin, where we've had very high water levels. And there's a bunch of houses there that never had water around them, that now have a lot of water around them. Um, this particular situation, a lot of these, they, they've, they've dug a, a, basically a large channel to take the water to the Wisconsin River, which was very controversial in itself. Um, so I think that you know, with some of these changes, either high water levels or low water levels, we're going to see some interesting issues. Um, you folks know about some of the nuisance conditions that have been created. Uh, this is on the Great Lakes, um, you know, and uh, this is some of the material that's washed in uh, to shore. Um, there also are issues, and I understand this is now an issue on Lake Winnebago with uh, some of the mussel shells that have washed up. Uh, DNR adopted some rules uh, in our 345 Wisconsin Administrative Code dealing with removal of the algae and vegetation and the mussel shells. Uh, my understanding is that there is a proposal to expand this to Lake Winnebago and some of the other inland lakes where, where there are issues. Um, I served before I retired on a committee looking at, called Wind on the Water, which was looking at putting uh, wind turbines in the Great Lakes. Um, you know, in 2008, uh, this was a, a real serious proposal. It's sort of, you know, it's now off the table, but it may be back. Uh, but as we were looking at this, um, I. You know, it basically says Lake Michigan offers the greatest opportunities. Um, there's a need for further study. Um, I contacted the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and um, found out that they've granted 59 preliminary permits for 160,000 turbines in the Mississippi River from Illinois south to New Orleans. Uh, and they've granted over 100 wave and tidal permits around the U.S. Um, this is a turbine that's been put, up, put in up in Minnesota. Um, you know, it's underwater and it may not cause any problems, but it, I find it's, you know, it might raise some interesting issues. Uh, if you Google hydrokinetic turbines, you'll see all sorts of proposals or things that have been built um, all over the, the world. Uh, this is in Portugal, and they have these large sort of boxcar-like things out in the water. Uh, and as they go up and down, they generate electricity. Uh, lots of wind farms in, in Europe out in the water. <coughs> Um, there's a proposal at Cape Wind in Massachusetts, which uh, you've probably read about in the papers. This is going forward. Um, this is a mock-up that was done of, of what this is going to look like when it's constructed. Um, and I know myself and other staff people for the agency were worried about, you know, if we're going to do this on Lake Michigan or other large lakes in Wisconsin, what does this do to natural scenic beauty? At night, each one of these has a large red blinking light. Um, and if they put out 12 miles in Lake Michigan, then you can't see them on the horizon. Um, and technically, they could do that, but um, I, and I think this is something that's going to be revisited that we'll see again. Um, these are some things from the United Kingdom and Australia, uh, these small river turbines. Um, there were proposals to put these in some of the backwaters of the Mississippi River. At this point, I don't think those are going forward uh, from a Energy standpoint, they probably make sense. I think, you know, from a navigability standpoint and a habitat standpoint, I think it raises some interesting questions. You know, the mining issue um, came up. I think it's gone away for a while. Um, I'm not opposed to mining, but I think that, you know, we have to have strong standards if we are going to have mining. Um, these are some of the ones up in Minnesota. Um, there was a recent special session. Um, I won't talk about this a lot, but I was involved in some of the legislative proposals there. Um, there was a proposal initially that um, you know, was stripped out of the legislation. Myself and others testified against it. This is over at Two Rivers. And there was a proposal that would have authorized the placement of these four condominium buildings on what is today open water in Lake Michigan. And the way the statute was written, it would have allowed this sort of development of hotels, condos, retail facilities on lots of lake beds around the state. 
Um, you know, that was stripped out, but uh, I think it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we may see more of, and I, I personally don't want to see any more convention centers on valleys of water either. Um, you know, should these proposals concern you? I think that, you know, they should. Um, you know, I think many of them were not consistent with the trust doctrine. But cumulatively, I think that they'd have tremendous impacts if they were allowed. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, you folks here, obviously you're motivated because you're out here tonight, you know, listening to, to people talk about water. Um, you can have real impact in the legislature if things are happening there that you're concerned about. Uh, whichever side you're on, uh, make your voice heard. Um, I went and testified on this bill along with a lot of other people, and I was very pleased to say that the, you know, the four worst things were stripped out of the bill. You know, there were still some things that were changed that personally I didn't agree with, but you know, it wasn't a constitutional issue, and the legislature you know, made their public policy decisions. Um, you know, it's sobering for me at my age to think about the changes that we've made to our waterways over my lifetime. And these are some maps that were developed um, at UW from the, uh, the um, Applied Population Laboratory, uh, 1940 housing density uh, in northern Wisconsin. You know, this, uh, these orange blocks here, or dark brown blocks, are where there's 40 or more units per square mile. Um, this was a 1990 uh, density, and this was the projection for 2010. Um, I haven't gone back to see if they have updated maps. Uh, I suspect they do at this point. Uh, but you know, any of you who drive around the state or in your own neighborhood, you see that we are having more and more development. And that's not a bad thing, but I think we need to be conscious of you know, what we do and how it impacts our, our waterways. Uh, I drove some years ago down to the Lake of the Ozarks. Um, I was working in this job. I took my wife and two young children down there, and I'll never forget the time I came over the top of a ridge and I saw a bay that looked like this. Um, you know, I don't think Wisconsin will ever get like this. Um, you know, I think that people here have too much sensitivity, and I think that you know, people, uh, the laws here, at least as they currently exist, would not allow this. But there was a lot of this on the Lake of the Ozarks. Um, you know, there's no habitat left. There's no scenic beauty left. And I know personally from my experience that there are some developers who think this would be a great thing to do in Door County and other places around the state. Um, you know, I am able to enjoy some fishing. This is a fish I caught on Lake Mendota in, in Madison last fall. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that my sons and, you know, that the future generations are able to enjoy our waterways here in the state. Um, you know, when I made this slide, I thought, should I put 300 years up here or 3,000? Um, I think we need to think in those terms, you know, and we need to think about, you know, what's, what is going to happen in the future what impacts are we having and what can we do to improve our waters? And again, I know that all of you people here uh, being out here on a, on, a, on a cold Monday night are motivated uh, to try to protect with our resources. And so I think you know, citizens need to be actively involved in this. You know, I'll close with um, you know, one of my favorite Elder Leopold um, quotes. And um, you know, I think we've done a good job in Wisconsin. Um, there are always going to be tensions. Um, one of the things that constantly amazed me as I've dealt with these issues, often very controversial issues around the state, are how polarized people on a body of water can become with some people wanting more water and some people wanting less water and some people wanting dredging and some people not wanting dredging. Um, and you know, in an ideal world, when we got done with those projects, everybody would be happy. But after a few years in my job, I tell young staff, you know, we've done our job well if everybody leaves here a little bit unhappy. You know, and it's sort of painful to say, but I think that that's often what we had to do to balance those interests. And as you deal with issues here, um, I'm sure there are going to be, you know, there are always passions about what should be done and what can be done. Um, I guess I, I hope that when you look at people from the department, you look at them and say, well, you know, they've got a professional job to do. And I, my experience, and I'm somewhat biased, is they usually try to do a professional job and balance those competing interests. And it's only with input you know, from people like yourselves that that can really be successful. So you know, that's my story on the trust doctrine. If we have some time, I can try to answer a few questions. And thank you very much for your attention.